Hi, we are Manali, Mariam, and Sina, and we have been working on how to build a medical Q&A system. Our work was accompanied by our mentors, Tristan and Markus. Thank you very much. Our distinct goal was to build a Q&A engine that is able to answer questions that are asked every day in primary healthcare. For example, can I still work out with a sore knee? Or I have a cold, why don't I get antibiotics? And we wanted our engine to answer, well, like a healthcare professional, natural sounding, detailed and explanatory. We think that such a tool could be great in situations where no physician or pharmacist is available, or also in situations where barriers make communication with healthcare professionals difficult, or if pharmacies want to provide their patients more services. And last but not least, it's a cool tool to show healthcare professionals what AI can do. Um, let's jump right into how we solve that problem. Um, here you see uh, the basic structure of our backend. When a question is asked, it first passes a classifier, which decides if it's a healthcare question or not. If it's not a healthcare question, the questionnaire is made aware that the engine is built to answer healthcare questions. And otherwise, if it's a healthcare question, the question is passed to a text generating model of your choice. Uh, let me now explain how this classifier, the filter works. We had to build it completely on our own. And because it's a supervised learning task, we needed, well, a labeled data set. We had on the one hand, many, healthcare questions, that was the easy part. But we needed, on the other hand, diverse questions except healthcare questions that didn't exist. So we took a diverse data set with questions like the Stanford question and answering data set and manually labeled it. And we put together a data set that was well balanced. Um, on text data, our classifier couldn't be trained on. So we needed some pre-processing steps. And um, what first happened happens is that each sentence, each, qu each question is broken down into word pieces or subwords and then mapped to a vocabulary so that at every sentence is represented as a sequence of numbers. And then it passes a language model, the distributed model, um, which understands language very well. And we, in simplified words, um, extracted with that model the meaning of each sentence represented as an embedding vector with 786 dimensions. And if a sentence has, if sentences have similar meanings, they have closer numbers in their vectors. And that's something our classifier um, could work with. And we first tried a very simple model, a logistic regression model. And we were really surprised that we achieved such a good result an accuracy of 98%. Wow, that's cool. And we were happy because that's good enough for our task. And we asked ourselves, why did that work so well? And um, visualized what the distributed model returns and used a computationally beautiful trick and um, projected those large vectors with over 700 dimensions down to 2D, which means that each sentence, the meaning is represented by two numbers now, and plotted the density of 
um, the different kinds of questions. And you can see in this visualiz visualization that, well, that's the, the question types are almost linearly separable in 2D. Um, on the, if a question is on the upper left side, it's very likely a healthcare question and vice versa. And what works well in 2D works even better in over 700D. And that's why our model had such a high accuracy. Um, okay, question is classified now. What happens next will explain you, Mariam. Thank you, Sina. Um, so now I will walk you through how we um, implemented the answer generation model. Uh, for this, um, we decided to use text generation models. And um, one of the most powerful text generation models are a family of models called generative pre-trained transformers, in short, GPT. These models are developed by OpenAI and use the decoder part of the general transformers um, as an autoregressor to generate text. So they predict the future word based on the past words. Um, <clears throat> Their best model, JPT3 DaVinci, with uh, 175 billion parameters uh, trained on 45 terabytes of data, is now able to do um, to generate coherent text. It can even write poems and it can even code. So we decided to use this model and explore its capabilities to answer health-related questions. But we also wanted to use a model that we could train on um, a local machine on a single GPU and. Um, GPT-3 is not open sourced, and even if it was, it's so big that we cannot handle it on a single GPU. So uh, we looked for the biggest model that it was possible to be trained on a single GPU, and that was GPT-2 Medium, uh, which is available by Hugging Face Transformers. So we selected this model. And uh, for fine tuning, we collected a list of question answers from uh, websites that uh, provide the, this type of question answers related to health. Um, and we also explored this data. We found out that the data from WebMD has a higher quality. Um, so we decided to go into past. Uh, first, we decided to train a model on WebMD, which has a higher quality and also to uh, use all the data. Um, yeah, to use all the data uh, for the training. And we generated our training samples starting with the start of text token and ending with an end of text token to show um, the start of an end of the question answer pair. We uh, wrote a question keyword and fo uh, followed the question by it and um, the same for the answer. We ran the training for uh, WebMD data and all the data and took the model with the lowest validation loss. For GPT-3, we uh, experimented with uh, prompt engineering. Uh, first, uh, we just asked, simply asked our question from the model. That's called zero-shot learning. Uh, second, uh, we provided the model with five question answers and then we followed by our uh, question. Uh, this is called fusion learning. And then finally, we interacted the, uh, with the model via text. We gave the model some instructions and then um, asked the model our question. And the instruction were like the length of the answer that we want to uh, have and that we want to have a scientific answer. And finally, we use different decoding methods. So GPT uh, at each stage uh, outputs a probability distribution for different words. Uh, a greedy way of decoding uh, is that we take uh, the word with highest probability, but this does not result in the best uh, sentence or general uh, sequence. Um, so we try different decoding methods. We try to sharpen or flatten the probability distribution using a parameter called temperature. We use beam search uh, so that instead of getting the word or token with the highest probability, we uh, chose the sequence with the highest probability. And we also uh, use top K and top P parameter, parameters that limit the set of tokens that can be used in total for text generation. 
Uh, so we experimented the models out with, with all these parameters and took the best setting. And finally, um, we evaluated the model's performance using 85 questions. And our the team's domain expert, Sina, rated each answer uh, with, uh, yeah, subjectively by the amount that the answer was uh, harmful or useful. And then, um, yeah, what we can observe here from the uh, scores of different models is, uh, Comparing GPT-2 and GPT-3, we see that GPT-3 uh, has a score of one point higher in general than GPT-2. Uh, looking at the GPT-2s, we see that fine tuning improved the score so by a point three a point. But we also see that fine tuning with all the data compared to WebMD only did not improve um, the performance of the model pointing to the importance of the quality of the data that we use for training. And uh, for GPT-3, we see uh, that the when we provided the model with, in with instructions about the length of the model um, and the style of the answer, uh, it, it gave us the best uh, answers. So we selected uh, that setting for our uh, GPT-3. And now um, Manali will show us how the model performs in action. Thank you, Maria. <clears throat> so now architecture with our front end, we have created our front end with uh, using Envid tool, which is based on Python language. Uh, so front end will select or accept the request from the user as a question and transfer them to the back end and backend, then uh, from backend, frontend will display the answer to the user. So next is our result with respect to GPT-2 model and as well as GPT-3 model. So the question is, how should medicines be stored? So first one, answer by an expert. Second one, answer by a GPT-2 model. And last one, answer by GPT-3 model. So you can see here, our both model, GPT-2 and GPT-3 are performing very well, giving the best results. So the next question, why don't I get antibiotics when I have a cold? So answer by an expert, it is saying that antibiotics are generally not effective against the viruses. So you can read the answer by GPT-2, it is a horrible, like <laughs> it is suggesting that you should take the antibiotics every day. So it can be very harmful, but you can see the answer by GPT-3 model. So it is quite good and also similar with uh, answer by an expert. So very informative. So next is live demo with Anvil 2. Uh, you can find our web application link uh, here. So <laughs> this is our web application. And of course, we are dealing with the diagnosis and medication. So there is a disclaimer. So now we will see what happened with non-healthcare related question. So if I ask, how is the weather in Berlin? Oh, so it is classifying very well. So it is not related to healthcare question. How can I treat a sunburn? So the answer is by GPT-3 model. So you can read. It is a quite good answer. Like sunburn can be effectively treated with variety of topical agents that are available over the counter. It is quite good result. Uh, that's better, seems to be better. Yes, it's good for fever because it's a pain reliever and fever reduce, that's true. Um, yeah, that's not too bad. Not a very good answer, but it's not too bad. Yep. Now, Sina will uh, take you through the conclusion and next steps. So as you saw, the factfulness is not always guaranteed, but the model is often very correct. 
Um, and um, what could have been also better is the quality and quantity of our training better um, data. So we would have ended with a better open source model. Um, and also you have to pay for using GPT-3. It costs about one cent or a little bit less for every request. Um, and if you want to train an open source model, that's also costly. Um, it would start when you want to train, let's say, GPTJ with six billion parameters, would start with a few hundred euro. Uh, and you can go up to open end. Um, we think that our application is absolutely not ready to get into hands of patients, but it would be a very valuable tool. For example, if a pharmacy uses messenger systems to communicate with patients and they ask questions, it would be a cool tool to generate a few answers and then maybe modify one of them slightly and then copy paste and send the text. I can imagine that would save one or two minutes for each answer. And let's imagine a pharmacy receives 30 questions, submits for every question three times, and it would cost one euro a day, or maybe a little bit less, and you would save 30 to 60 minutes. That's, that's a good trade-off, right? So we think that's already a cool tool to use in practice. Um, our next steps um, is we want to really train a larger open source model like GPTJ with 6 billion parameters, and we're very curious about the outcome. We also want to deploy our application, how it is now. And um, another idea is to implement a translation pipeline so the app is available in many different languages. And another cool idea is to implement, for example, a feature that you can upload pictures and get an estimate. So um, you're very welcome to have a look at our GitHub uh, repo or also on our LinkedIn profiles. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>